Kia ora tato. Uh, so lovely to be here this morning. My name is Charlie Thomas. Uh, thank you so much for having me in this beautiful space. Thank you for braving the weather to come and see me. I'm so excited to tell you guys a little bit about my life and my experiences with art and conservation. So I am born and bred Kiwi. I've lived in New Zealand my whole life. I'm 20 years old. I used to live in Whangaparoa with my family and up until about eight months ago, I moved to Waiheke Island to start working for an organisation called Te Korowai o Waiheke, where we are working on stoat eradication and, and a, a trialling, trying to get rid of rats as well. So my work there is as the monitoring technician, which means I get to spend all day, every day out in the bush and enjoying the birds and the wildlife and everything like that, which is pretty special. Um, at home, I have my family and my dog. Um, my family live in Red Beach, so I grew up every day at the beach, walking my dog, spending time with the birds and that sort of thing, which is so lovely. And yeah, I spend most of my life outdoors, making the most of our marine environment, our land environment, and you know, everything that I can. I have had a passion for the environment from a very, very young age. Um, nothing has changed much apart from a lot. Um, <laughs> and, um, so my passion for the environment came from, I literally cannot remember when I started picking up bugs and lifting up rocks and that sort of thing. My parents have always told me that they also cannot remember because it's just been a part of me my entire life. I've been so lucky to have been exposed to so many incredible experiences from such a young age, spending time with Department of Conservation, um, Wingspan Trust, and just, gosh, everything. I spent a lot from the age, from age nine, I've been volunteering with Auckland Museum to help rehome specimens and that sort of thing. My best friend has rude climbed past the bug man. <laughs> He's been the most amazing mentor ever. And yeah, it's been a pretty exciting life for me surrounded by bugs and birds and all things wonderful. So my last four years since I left high school uh, when I was 16 and decided school was great, not quite my jam. <laughs> I found that I was getting so much more out of my extracurricular activities by volunteering with different organisations, helping out PhD students with their studies and that sort of thing and that's how I fell in love with seabirds and I've spent every second of the last four years, all my time off school, dedicating what I can to helping seabirds and other birds, but mostly seabirds. Um, I was really lucky, that picture on the left, uh, those, both those two pictures on the left are from an island called Kira Atoll, which I'll talk a little bit about later, where I spent, managed to spend all of 2020, yes, 2020, <laughs> on the most remote island atoll in the world. <laughs> so I'll tell you a little bit about that later, but um, there's also a picture here of me with a very gorgeous fluffy grey-faced petrel, which I was talking about earlier, at Tafaranui Peninsula. And these are all things and spaces that, you know, when you love something so much, like I love these turns and albatrosses and petrels, it like just creates this crazy fire inside you. And I spent so long like, what do I do with all this burning passion and energy that I have for these things? And, um, and I found art and I've been drawing for a really, really long time. And it sort of, it started with drawing bugs and birds and then I was drawing people and you know, stuff like that. And then I started working for a charity called Sea Cleaners and I spent all of 2019 working as a deckhand on boats that go up around the Hauraki Gulf um, and the Manukau Harbour and up north as well, cleaning up marine debris off our coastlines and off islands and out of muddy rivers and that sort of thing, which was just such an eye opener for me. I was 17, you know, my first full time job and I was once again able to spend all day, every day, outside, enjoying our marine environment, helping to educate others. We had, we'd take groups of volunteers out with us on the boats, and every day I was able to teach people about, about birds, about the impact of plastic on our marine environment, and show it to them in person. And there was one particular day where uh, we were off the coast of Rangitoto Island, and I saw a, a, a pied cormorant, which I have in my hands there, that was flying along and ended up crashing into the water because it had a huge lump of nylon hanging off the back of it. And I ended up chasing that bird for about, it hit the water and it didn't come up. And I was like, right, okay. So I launched the kayak off the boat and I spent about 20 minutes paddling around after it. And if you guys have ever seen a cormorant in the water, they don't put their heads up out of the water for very long, especially if it's not happy. So I was dealing with, you know, 10 seconds of bird sticking its head out, looking around, and then two minutes of swimming around trying to chase it. But eventually I managed to corner it. And I, 
throttled it, grabbed it in the boat and took it back. And I was able to remove all of the nylon off of its wings and, and stuff like that and release it happy as. And hopefully it's still fine, but it swam off happy. So that was a really, that was a really good news story for me because a lot of my job at Sea Cleaners, I was finding comrades like that that didn't have such a happy ending, that had died wrapped up in nylon or full of plastic or that sort of thing. And that this, this really stuck with me for a while afterwards and I just felt really unsettled and uneasy for about a week after. I couldn't quite figure out what it was and so I decided to sit down and just paint what I was feeling and I ended up painting this picture which is um, A2. So it's one of, my, one of my bigger paintings, but finishing it and being able to share that message of the impact that fishing nylon is having on these birds every single day. Like, you know, there is, cormorants are so smart and that as soon as they see a boat go out to go fishing and you put your line in the water, there will be a cormorant there sitting there waiting to steal your bait or steal your fish or something. Um, so this picture helped me, you know, have some closure and feel better about everything that happened and also um, talk a little bit more about, you know, just spreading that awareness. And the theme of plastic continued for me as my job at Sea Cleaners continued. Um, obviously, plastic plays a huge role in pollution in the marine environment, and it was a lot of what I was dealing with on a day to day basis. And I was having all these horrible pent up emotions. I was just so distraught about the state of the Gulf and what I was seeing every single day. And being able to paint these just changed everything for me. I was able to turn all of that horrible destroy energy into something creative that I could share with people that people could share with other people and it's a little bit more digestible and it's not you know you open up Facebook and you see pictures of whales full of plastic and stuff like that and it's it's horrible and it doesn't feel it, it never filled me with hope it just made me feel sad and so creating these pictures helped me you know spread this spread this message in a way that was easier to look at and think about and this picture on the on the right was actually after I can't remember, I think it must have been 2019 that I did it but it was when the mother when a big uh, female sperm whale washed up with the dead calf inside and also like a whole I can't remember how much plastic but like her entire stomach was totally full of plastic and that really stuck with me so that was what inspired this picture as well um, but I was with through my um, before I actually got my job at Sea Cleaners. I was selected as a youth ambassador to spend a week on the North Shore of Oahu, which you would think is beautiful and pristine and clean, green surfing, whatever. And don't get me wrong, it's beautiful, and I absolutely fell in love with that place. But when we got to the to the coastline. There was no sand, it was just plastic. It was nothing but microplastic for as far as we could see. It was coming in on the tide and the water and everything. And it was just heartbreaking. I'd, I'd been to Hawaii a couple times before with my family for holidays and hadn't experienced anything like this. And that really shook me. And it, like that big ghost net down there, that big net, there are so, so many of those all up and down the coastline. And they come from fishing vessels that just Instead of getting a net fixed, they just snip it and let it drift off into the ocean. And they're called ghost nets because even after they've stopped being used commercially, they will continue to kill stuff and, grab and wrap up with sharks and turtles and coral. They rip all the coral off the seabed and it is awful. And it took like eight people to move that big chunk of rope as well. So it was pretty distressing and once again inspired me to do some art about it to spread that message. But while I was on the North Shore of Oahu, I learned that there were albatrosses living in Hawaii. And I was like, no, no way. Albatrosses in Hawaii? I thought they were all, you know, down south in New Zealand. And I couldn't quite believe it. So when I heard of an island called Kure Atoll, I also heard, of, first I heard about the island, this is Kure Atoll. First I heard about Midway Atoll and the impact, and that is where most of these albatrosses live. Now, some of you might know Midway Atoll from the Battle of Midway back in World War II. Um, it's about 2,000 miles northwest of uh, the main Hawaiian Islands. And if you're lucky, you can get on a very, very limited flight, or you can get on a ship that takes seven days to get there. And Midway and Kure Atoll are two huge refuges for these amazing albatrosses that I just fell head over heels in love with. Um, I was very lucky to have spent all of 2020, just about all of 2020, living on this atoll here. And you can see, this is actually, this is quite an old photo, um, back when they used to have a big tower in the middle to 
send out signals so that people wouldn't crash into it. And it used to have a runway where the Coast Guard would land their planes there and take care of the, um, the RAND station. But when I was there, it was me, three Americans, and 35,000 albatrosses, and not much else. <laughs> and Curie Atoll is really special because there is no cell phone reception, no internet, no Wi-Fi, no running water, no electricity. Everything is solar, rainwater. Um, you have to be so careful with all of your resources, going for a walk outside, you know, that literally, like you saw that picture at the beginning was taken on Curie. There is, you know, at least an albatross per square meter. You can't go anywhere without seeing, you know, my field of vision here, if I was standing in a paddock on, on Curie, would just be thousands of albatross. And it is remarkable and I obviously oh yes and when I so I obviously missed Curie and Midway a lot those islands changed my life so so much and I think about there's there's not a day go, goes by where I think about Curie and I think about what might be happening on those islands and being able to do little paintings of them and share them with my friends and family and other people who are also super connected to those islands was really special to me um, I was able to once again convey those emotions of this real deep um, sadness and missing of, of Curie because it's, I really can't put into words how being so remote in such a special place for so long changes you. Um, but it was pretty special for me to be able to paint these and have these with me all the time. Um, and of course, these are the beautiful albatrosses that I was talking about. How could you not fall in love with a face like that? Honestly, I saw my first baby lace and albatross picture. And I just about cried. These are the cutest things you will ever see in your life. And the, the, the wonderful thing is about the albatross on this island is that they have no fear of humans because the only people that are there are researchers and biologists and restoration conservationists who are just, we're in, their, we're, we're in their world, you know. It kind of feels like sometimes, you know, living on main, mainland New Zealand, even on Waiheke, that the animals are coming into our space, birds are coming into our space and that sort of thing. You know, you see birds in the CBD and in the city and you think, oh, the birds are moving in, but really we were the ones that moved into their space. So living on Cure, I was able to get a really good idea of what it felt like to just have to quietly exist with next to no footprint and the most, you know, it's, it, we're trying to restore it to the untouched paradise that it was before people turned up there and started wreaking havoc and introducing invasive weed species and that sort of thing. Um, but it was, it was seriously remarkable. Like, you know, from my walk to the, from the bunkhouse to the main house to get breakfast in the morning was about 30 seconds. And it's this tiny, skinny little coral path. And as you're walking down that coral path, there's an albatross walking towards you or something sitting in the middle of the path. You just, you stand to the side and you wait for it to walk past you and then you continue, you know. If there's an albatross sitting in your shower, no shower for you. To be honest, the shower was just like a hose from a tank like inside a lean-on against the shed. So, you know, you just go for a swim anyway. But being able to exist in their world like that was just unbelievable. And they became my muse for a long time. I spent so many hours painting these beautiful birds because I just couldn't stop looking at them. There's so much charisma and just expression in their faces. And it was so lovely, all the little wispy bits. And it was so nice to be able to paint a beautiful creature and highlight all those tiny details in its bill and in its face and feathers and stuff like that. And then I did these before I moved to Cure, before I was living on Cure. And to be able to paint this and then go and actually live with them was just like amazing. It was so, so special. And albatrosses remain my favorite animal. Um, there's something about this face that I just, <laughs> I just can't get over, you know. All of these photos were taken with a zoom lens, obviously, but you know, one of my, what, what I loved to do was I would just go and I'd just stand somewhere quietly or sit somewhere quietly with my wide angle lens or my telephoto. And I'd just wait for, for an albatross or something to walk up to me and have a look at me, you know. There's no intruding on anyone's space. You're just so respectful and letting them check you out. You know, you're not allowed to make eye contact or interact with it. You just take the pictures and then go back to the bunkhouse and look afterwards. And, you know, I was able to capture some absolutely amazing images that have just stuck with me so much. And yeah, this, this was, I loved albatrosses before I moved to, to, before I went to Curie in Midway, but they've absolutely taken over my life since. And 
I cannot stop painting them. <laughs> there was a while there where I literally painted nothing but albatrosses and I thought, okay, I need to paint some other stuff. You know, there's more animals out there, Charlie, come on. Those are the birds that need your help. <laughs> and, but no, I, 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 I fell head over heels in love with these amazing birds. And I've now seen half of the world's albatross species, which is very exciting. And um, I even painted every single one of them in one picture for World Albatross Day last year, <clears throat> which was very cool. And I have yet to see some of them, but um, I'm, I'm hoping that one day I will because they are just absolutely magnificent. And once again, this, this poster got shared all over the place for World Albatross Day. And people, there are people who love seabirds and, you know, albatrosses and stuff, but they don't realize that there's about approximately 23 species of them and where they come from. They don't know that there's a species in Japan, a species in Galapagos, that New Zealand has so many different species of albatross. New Zealand is the seabird capital of the world, which most people don't know. And I think that is something so, so special. So this, this was, this was this, the first picture on the left is something that when I first went to, when I first went to um, the North Shore of Oahu and I was an ambassador for sea cleaners, I heard about a guy called Chris Jordan and he'd made a film called Albatross, which was on Midway Atoll that he filmed across about eight years, I think. And it's less of a documentary. I feel like it's more of an art piece. It was watching this documentary. I just sat at home and sobbed for the entirety of it, pretty much. I, I could not recommend more that you watch his film. It's called Albatross. You can watch it for free online. And it changed my whole perspective on everything. You know, these beautiful, beautiful birds that have the most amazing courting and dancing sequences and they mate for life. You know, the oldest known albatross at the moment is a albatross called Wisdom and she's 70. I think she just turned 70 and um, she lives on Midway. She just had a chick last year, you know, she's still going. She's got <laughs> grandbabies galore <laughs> and it's incredibly special. And but watching, watching Albatross not only broke my heart, but gave me, like, it just relit that, that spark for, for passion and for these birds. And um, I actually ended up getting in touch, well, my amazing dad got in touch with Chris Jordan before I left for Cure, and he told him what I was doing. And lo and behold, I get this email back from Chris, who is, like, at this point, my, like, biggest mentor ever. I was so inspired by him and the beauty of this film and he sends me this amazing email saying you know how excited he is for me and I was really grateful for that because I was able to stay in touch with him while I was on Cure and that was really important for me because he had also gone through all of these different emotions that I was going through as I was watching these albatrosses literally every single one of them on that island you, it was very hard to find an albatross carcass that didn't have plastic in it. And, you know, that was a lot for me. That was really hard. You know, I love these animals so much. And being able to process and deal with that was made a lot easier by taking these pictures and, and being able to bring that story back. When I first watched Albatross, I thought, I need to go there. I need to see this with my own eyes and I need to bring it back and tell the story myself. You know, I was telling the story with his pictures which was amazing because they're incredible. But to be able to say, I've seen it, these are my photos, you know, this is plastic from inside one of those albatrosses on Curie Atoll, you know, it's, it's pretty crazy. And it, for me, it brings it home. And I think for you guys, I feel like you can connect to me and I'm connected to this. So it's those little, it's those little connections that make everything feel so much more real because you can see pictures like this on the internet and it feels like it's a million miles away because you know you don't know where it's come from or whatever so I feel like being able to bring these pictures home and talk about it just was so so important and so so important to me and I was able to paint it as well I did the picture on the this picture before I left for Cure I actually did this post watching um, Chris's documentary because I was just heartbroken <laughs> and um, I did the one on the left after coming home, I'd been home for about a year, I think, and I decided to rewatch Albatross and re-experience the, the sound of the birds, the, the visuals of the plants and the birds dancing and that sort of thing, and do some more writing and do another painting 
to you know reflect what I had seen and re-reflect on what I had experienced and I came up with this and once again you know those pictures those pictures from before are pretty they're pretty you know they're pretty full on you know it's that that bird on the left was only a chick both of them are potentially only chicks and they still had so 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 much plastic inside of them so you know without having to look at a picture of a dead bird you're still getting the same image of the amount of plastic that is in, potentially inside of them. Can I just, so that, that chick, the painting you've done there on the right, because I was looking at the chick thinking, so how did that chick ingest that much? But is the mother exactly. So the albatrosses on, on Curia and Midway, we have um, black-footed and laysan albatrosses and a few short-tailed. And their foraging grounds are the North Pacific Gaia, which is where the Great Pacific garbage patch is. And so where albatrosses are out at sea all day, all day, all day. In fact, they will be out at sea foraging for potentially a whole month or at least a few weeks to go and get food, find food, bring it back and feed their chick, which is on the island and obviously can't fly. Their nests are little bowls in the dirt. They don't move around very much. They rely completely and entirely on their parents. So when their mother comes back and their mother is thinks that it's eaten fish off the surface of the water, picked up bits of squid and fish eggs and stuff like that, and they come back, they don't know that they're feeding them plastic. And I've seen it. I've seen albatross chicks regurgitating Coca-Cola bottle lids and toothbrushes and all sorts of horrible things. And the regurgitation of undigestible stuff is normal because they get fed, fed squid beaks and pumice and other natural things that are floating. But it's the plastic that the amount of plastic that they're now being fed, that they can't, they can't, they obviously can't digest it, but they also can't bring it back up because it's just too much. And what albatross chicks need to do before they fledge is vomit everything up from their stomach. It's called a bolus, it's a, you know, a lump of indigestible stuff about this big that we would collect for scientific uses, research to try and figure out where, the, where their parents are foraging, you know, what they're eating and that sort of thing and they're all full of plastic now. And some of them aren't, some of them aren't, but a lot of them, most of them, are full of big chunks of plastic. And if they can't empty their stomachs before they fledge, then they will starve and they won't even make it to sea to have their first flight, which is seriously heartbreaking. And what I like to tell people is that, you know, if you have a look inside an albatross's stomach and you see anything in there that you might use on a daily, you know, have in your home, use on a daily basis, then that's, you know, I took a, took a look at a picture like that. I was like, right, you know, whatever I have in my home that's like that, I'm going to stop using once it's done for. You know, there's plastic lighters was one of the biggest things. I collected most of these from the interior of Curie Atoll, which means that whatever ate it, well, it, it the, the tide doesn't reach the middle of the island. It, it got there because something has eaten it and died. And there are a lot of these lighters, you know, bottle caps, uh, toothbrushes, plastic toys, anything that you could possibly imagine that's plastic and little, it's a, a bird's probably eaten it and either vomited it up or died because of it, which is really, really, really heartbreaking. And it's not just the plastic, you know, Cure is an atoll, super low lying. I think it's only about two meters above sea level. So not only the, the albatross there face the plastic issues, they also face climate change and they're really extreme, you know, from going from extreme heat to extreme storms and stuff like that. These poor gorgeous little birds just can't handle those sorts of really extreme changes. So they are faced with all sorts of challenges on a daily basis. Um, the one that's easiest to illustrate for me is the plastic. And it's the one that, you know, people can immediately make a difference in their lives. You know, you don't have to buy a plastic bottle of Coca-Cola, <laughs> you can bring a drink bottle from home or something like that. But it's not all doom and gloom. I like to paint, uh, mostly paint on um, New Zealand native bird species. Uh, I find it's a really cool way to connect people to the wildlife in their backyard. And if it's not in their backyard, maybe it will be someday. You know, some of these birds are really special. I'm quite lucky to be living on Waiheke Island where I have banded rail and kaka and kiriru and uru in my backyard on a daily basis. And, you know, by showing, pe by showing people pictures of these birds that they may have never even seen or heard before, they think, oh, you know, that's gorgeous. You know, why don't I see them around? What can we do to increase them? Or even just having a picture of one on your wall, it just 
it's just lovely, you know? It just brings that little bit of something different, something special into your home. And I think there is so, so much to be learnt by connecting with the wildlife in our backyard because there is no way that anything's gonna happen if you don't have those little experiences. You know, you don't look outside and you, you, you know, you might look outside and you see a bird and you think, oh, that's new. I remember seeing a drawing of one of those somewhere and you connect the dots and stuff starts to fall into place. And it's those little experiences that make a real difference in the long run with bigger change, you know, because people aren't gonna wanna change if they don't know anything about what they're doing or if they can't connect it, connect to it at all. So. I love to paint these cuties, mostly in watercolour, um, although there's some, this, this guy was in gouache and the Peka Peka Turoa at the top was for the Bird of the Year campaign, which I was <laughs> very pleased that a bat won that, that, was, that made my day. Um, and I found that after doing, those, doing the watercolour birds and kind of sticking to what the birds look like and that sort of thing, I could branch out and I could start doing whatever I wanted. And so I started playing with the colours and patterns and you know, incorporating um, the Māori names of fish and birds and stuff like that so that I'm starting to build te reo back into my daily use and other people are learning you know, um, the different like tuna and eka and that sort of thing and they're also starting to learn as well. And I love these for kids' bedrooms. They just, I, when I did these, they were little and I did them in, um, in lockdown last year before I moved to Waiheke and they were just such a joy to paint because I would just start putting color on the page and whatever it became, it became. And I managed to turn it into birds or fish or something most of the time, but it was just an absolute joy. And stuff has started to come full circle now, which is pretty exciting. Um, you know, growing up, I read Powell's book, a uh, Natural History Guide and looked at all the scientific drawings, was copying them. That's how I learned to draw, was copying his drawings of squid and spiders and that sort of thing. So to now be looking at my own art and thinking of it the same way as, you know, I'm able to get these. The, the best way to learn about a creature is to draw the teeniest, tightsiest details that you possibly can. And then there's no way you will ever forget what it is or how to draw it again or how to identify it. And to know that my drawings are now looking like the drawings that I was reading about in natural history guides has just been so like so fulfilling to me and very exciting. And I love Wetapunga just as much as I love albatross, I think. They might be one of my favorite creatures in the world, which is um, pretty cool. So this might be, I think, one of my favorite drawings ever. And yeah, it was, it was pretty special. Um, Along with the, with the ink drawings and the art and the painting and the photos of birds came blogs that I was writing and you know there's, there's only so much that a picture can do. A picture can show you the image and show you what I was thinking about or where I was but I found that writing a blog about it or a, a, an essay or just a piece of writing actually was able to put you in the place and I found that that is what people most connected with was you know, having a drawing alongside a piece of my writing, talking about the experience as well, uh, which was pretty special. So I thought to finish off, I would show you, I would read you an excerpt from one of the blogs that I wrote while I was on Cure. Um, I wrote, I wrote a thousand words a day, I think for a month, I just couldn't stop writing. And then it got to a point where I was like, written out <laughs> and, and I started just focusing on the really, uh, well, everything was an amazing experience, but focusing on the little things. And we, I was able to send, and receive short emails on Cure via, via satellite phone. And this is the first time that I'd left home and mum is obviously back here. Mum and dad and my sister are back here. Pandemic. <laughs> I'm, 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 everybody at home was isolating, but I was also isolated, but it's just a completely different type of isolation. So um, I was getting these emails back saying that people were loving reading my writing and that it was taking them away to this special place where you know, everybody, was in this totally weird situation back home. So I'll read you a little bit of one of my favorite ones that I wrote called Beauty and Life and Death, because there is a lot of life, but with that came a lot of death on Cure. And I don't think I'll ever look at death the same after living there. I found beauty in the strangest places here. The most wonderful is when the albatross rear their heads, collect their bills and begin to dance. Life flows and abounds from the tips of their ruffled feathers, it drips as water from the, hook of their from the hook of their beaks. It rings in my ears with every trill, excited whistle, and in the hallowed moos that echo throughout the island. 
They touch bills and bump breasts with wings bent at all angles, their bodies held high above the ground on the tippiest of toes. Even in the occasional silence that is held between a pair, there is much being conveyed in their deep gaze that we couldn't be even begin to understand. Every head bob and bill clack is sheer joy at its finest, though it is a joy dissimilar to ours. The complex emotions of our animals is something I may never understand, but here I feel I am very close to sharing in it with them. They feel joy and excitement without even knowing what it is. It is just a sensation that life offers them, and they live every moment of it with an unbridled passion that is comparable to nothing. Thank you so much for listening so quietly and carefully. And if you would like to read more of my blogs or get in touch or have a look at my art on Instagram, you're more than welcome to up there. But I would love to answer any questions now if anybody has them.